Hello, my name is Victor Lopez. This is Direct Democrats. At the end of the video, you will find the details if you want to contact me, because I would love to talk about direct democracy anywhere in the world, debate, be interviewed, etc. I am convinced direct democracy, Swiss style direct democracy, is the best political system that we have available to everybody now. My mission in life now is to spread the word and the facts about Swiss style direct democracy. Today's video is going to be about the recent resignation of the New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern. It appears that uh, many factors could have, could have triggered that. One could be maybe she's a bit of a burned out, maybe she feels disillusioned because her polls uh, indicate that uh, she has dropped sharply, that the competitive party, the national party, the conservative party, now is slightly more popular than her party, and uh, she's gone. But I, my interest in today's video is not to study why it happened in New Zealand, the specific details, because I really no expert on New Zealand, but my thesis is if New Zealand had the Swiss system of direct democracy, Jacinda Ardern would still be prime minister. Please listen to me. Don't turn me off quite yet. I say so for several reasons, and I'm going to give you these reasons. One, New Zealand has what I call the star system of representative democracy. For some reason, which I think it comes from the church and perhaps the Judeo-Christian tradition, uh, in most Western countries, in other countries is even worse the situation, somehow people feel there is a kind of one truth and one leader to deliver that. And then everything else is false or is inappropriate. So this idea makes the winning politicians in most representative democracies feeling they have something special, some special quality called leadership. And when that happens, they get surrounded by people who basically adore them. And when they win the elections, they also feel they have the mandate to do what it is that they want to do the way they understand it. They feel the people voted for me and they gave me a majority, therefore I can do anything I want until the next election. The people will judge me. Well, of course, when that happens, it's naturally that prime ministers and presidents will become burned out. First of all, they think they have a special view, they have a special perspective, and they have to carry out a special mission. I'm sure that's what happened to Jacinda Ardern when she won the election by the landslide a few years ago. She figured, wow, the people really want me to do things, therefore I'm going to do them. And one of the things she did is introduce very drastic policies on COVID, the way she and the experts or advisors that surrounded her understood it had to be done. She did it. I'm not sure if it was the right measure or the wrong measure. I have no idea. But for some reason, the measures angered many other New Zealanders. So many that her popularity started to drop. Now, it's not a matter of her being right or wrong. The fact of the matter is she decided with her own advisors what to do. And apparently many people in New Zealand found her measures excessive. As a result, her popularity started to drop. But because the re system of representative democracy has no way of correcting bad decisions without the politician or the party humiliating themselves, she hung on for a few more months until just now, a few days ago, she threw the towel in. She cannot cope. She says she has nothing in the tank. Well, I don't think it is that. I think she has a lot in the tank. What happens is that 
she ran the car so fast, she over revved it that she burned the engine. And now, of course, the car is no good and the car has to be taken out of service. And here's where my case is for Swiss direct democracy. In Switzerland, first, the elections are not as polarized as in New Zealand or all other representative democracies, because in the Swiss system, the politicians have a lot less power. The compensation at the end of the election, if they win, is not as high in Switzerland as it is in New Zealand, in Australia, in Canada, in the United States, in France, in Germany, in the UK, etc. And because it's not as high, the fight is not as vicious. And also is not made so vicious by the lobbies because the lobbies in the Swiss system do not have as much power as in representative democracies because if the politicians have less power, the lobbies don't see any sense in spending a lot of money lobbying the politicians or paying for politicians' political campaigns. So that's one thing. The election would not have been as polarized. Elections in Switzerland, in Switzerland are far less polarized than representative democracies, and it is because of that, because the power of the politicians is less, therefore don't fight as bitterly, nor do they fight as bitterly the lobbies behind them. That's one. Then the next one, which is also very important, is Switzerland does not have one president or one prime minister. The institution of the presidency in Switzerland is shared by seven equal people. And they rotate the post of president, which is a formality, among themselves every two years. So this means that there is not one single person in Switzerland that has as much power as a prime minister on New Zealand, a president in the United States, or in any other democracies. And also remember that the power of the politicians already in Switzerland is reduced. So you have one person out of seven in a system that gives the seven far less power than the prime minister or the president in representative democracies. That means that the profile of the people in the presidency in Switzerland is far, far lower because they have to share it among seven and also because they have less power. They cannot put in place policies like the one she did in New Zealand. The persons in the president in Switzerland, they couldn't for another reason. And the other reason is that in Switzerland, the politicians have realized a few decades ago that it is, it is much smarter to govern in coalition. That way, they don't risk that the power of the people knock down any policy, any law they pass. The politicians in Switzerland have realized Wait a minute. It makes no sense to pass a law or to put in place a policy that doesn't have the backing of the majority of the voters. So to ensure that we do that, what we're going to do is the four or five major parties will govern in coalition. And these four or five major parties represent 70 to 80 percent of the Swiss electorate. That means that when these parties make a decision on COVID, for example, the decision has been consensuated, has been lots of discussion. There's not this idea that the left-wing party in power implements whatever decision they feel is right, or the right-wing party or president and prime minister in power does whatever they think is right. No, nothing of this personalized power and nothing of this ability to carry out drastic measures without consensus. So this is, is very important. And also in Switzerland, they have another mechanism. They have the ability of the people to call referendums on the initiative of the people, not because the government decides to call a referendum, no, because the people, one single individual, 
could set in motion the machinery to take the COVID issue to a referendum. So the Swiss politicians, they have another advantage too. They say, look, maybe this decision is controversial, uh, even if we agree among ourselves, even if the major parties in power of, of the left and the right agree, but it may still contro be controversial. Well, in Switzerland, we have a way to correct this if the people do not approve. The people could bring a referendum to challenge the policy on COVID. And as a matter of fact, the Swiss people did that. Of course, the initial emergency measures, the executive and the government puts them in place the way they see fit. Because you don't have time to take everything to a referendum. In the case of the, of the virus, of the Wuhan virus, there was no time. People were dying, so you really have to do something. I'm not sure if the Swiss measures are very different from the ones in New Zealand. But even if they are similar, they are very different politically because in Switzerland, they have been consensuated by the government and the people will always have a chance to knock them off, to stop the policies. And this is what the Swiss did less than a year ago. Of course, it takes some time to organize a referendum and uh, the government put in place the measures. But the people, many people in Switzerland said, we are going to bring this to a referendum because we don't think the COVID policies the government is putting in place are right. We believe the vaccination policies are wrong. We believe they are excessive. We believe the passport is wrong. We believe it's excessive. Anyway, they got the number of signatures required, which in Switzerland is not too difficult to get and represents roughly about 1% of the voters. And there was a referendum. And the people agreed with the government. The people did not agree with the people who called the referendum. The people voted and the people agreed with the policies of the government. You can see easily, very easily, so obvious, that if New Zealand had these mechanisms, first, maybe the policies would not be as extreme because they would have been consensuated. And even if they were, the new people of New Zealand will, go, will have gone to a vote and maybe they would have agreed with Jacinda or maybe they would have disagreed. But there would be no need to this crazy polarization they have in New Zealand now, where people basically haunted the prime minister, threatened her, made her life miserable. And the polarization is just crazy. It's almost as bad as in the United States and in all these other representative democracies, including Canada, France, the UK, and many others, where the politicians put in place measures without sufficient backing, without sufficient agreement on the part of the people or the majority of the parties. So this is my case. My case is, if New Zealand was a Swiss-style direct democracy, not a California-style direct democracy, California doesn't really have direct democracy for many reasons. Two of them are, it's only direct democracy at the state level, and another one is the Supreme Court can overturn the results of California referendums. That is not possible in Switzerland. There are other factors too, like for example, the, the corruption, really you could say is corruption, because the amount of money that enters into California uh, referendums is absolutely crazy. And it's because a crazy decision by the US Supreme Court allowed unlimited contributions by corporations, by anybody, to political campaigns. So you have political campaigns in California, like all other campaigns in the U.S., not just the California referendums, that have been practically hijacked by money. Because if you don't have money, you cannot really fight a fair fight. And that means the people with money control the process it doesn't matter if you are left or right. Another thing that direct democracy does is diminishes polarization because it forces the parties to work together. So 
parties, even during elections in Switzerland, cannot be as extreme in their fighting as they are in the United States, in Canada, in France, in the UK, etc. That creates a more moderate climate and prevents polarization of the voters. I mean, polarization of the voters now in representative democracies is out of the scale. It's absolutely bananas. You wouldn't have ridiculous situations like the one I just noticed is on media. For example, CNN reports that the Jacinta Ardern popularity dropped drastically in New Zealand lately, as low as, I believe, 35% drop from about 50% when he won the election. And CNN says, in spite of that, she was very popular around the world, or she is very popular around the world. Well, that is not true, people of CNN. She is popular in the rest of the world, in media like CNN, and among, and among people who watch stations like CNN. Nothing wrong with that, but that doesn't mean the people in the world really like the Prime Minister so much. Because I am quite sure the conservative media, the right-wing media in the US and other places presented the opposite picture. What CNN did is like saying, is like Fox News, a conservative media in the States, saying that Trump, when he was president, who was very popular around the world, even if he was not popular with many people in the US. That is I'm not saying it's a lie, but it's really a distortion of the facts. The fact of the matter is that the majority of people in the world, they had no idea, idea about uh, Jacinda Ardern uh, and her policies. All they know is those who watch CNN or those who watch Fox News or similar media in their countries will have a view. Unfortunately, because people have become polarized, the people who often watch CNN or Fox News, they already watch those channels because, because they want reinforcement for their point of view. They're not really looking for information. You know, in this area, uh, information doesn't exist anymore. It's all political propaganda of either side. Another fact that direct democracy creates is that dilutes this crazy polarization of left versus right, left versus right, and if there were two truths that oppose each other. No, the direct democracy focuses on issues, and then that forces people to dial down the political ideology. This is what I wanted to say for today about direct democracy. And we can learn something from New Zealand. So if we don't want any more star prime minister, star presidents, semi-god kind of figures, uh, mythical figures, obviously made mythical by the propaganda around them, we need direct democracy. Dilute the power of the politicians, dilute the power of the executive, dilute the power of the legislature. And you will have the results the Swiss have had. And remember too, Switzerland is far less polarized than New Zealand in spite of the fact that Switzerland has three major different cultures, German, French, and Italian. And they're also a smaller culture of a few thousand, about 60,000 people uh, who speak Romance. But in spite of the traditional dislike of the Germans for the French, French for Germans, Germans from Italians, Italians from the other two. The German speakers of Switzerland, the French speakers of Switzerland, the Italian speakers of Switzerland, they get along marvelously compared to New Zealand, to Canada, to the United States, to UK, etc. And it is because of direct democracy. Direct democracy is a net improvement for democracy is the natural transition from representative democracy, which is a fantastic improvement over dictatorships and absolute kings. Direct democracy is also a fantastic improvement over representative democracy. 
This is all for today. My videos are all in closed captions, so you can watch them in any of 33 languages of the world. I mean not watch them. You can read the subtitles in any of the languages. The original video is in English. I can deliver speeches, talks, participate in forums, in debates, being interviewed anywhere in the world, anytime, in English or Spanish. Talking about Suez style direct democracy and how it is a clear improvement, the improvement we need for all representative democracies. I don't mention dictatorships because dictatorships, they are all illegitimate, immoral, they should not exist. Thank you very much and I hope you help me spread the word and the facts about direct democracy. Thank you very much.